Christ. Amen. Thank you all for standing. Uh, I, I grew up in the 80s. I, I call myself an 80s child. And uh, I'm lost, though, because I see children today. You got to tell them to go outside. It would be over 100 degrees, and my mother would be saying, come in the house. I mean, like, it's, it ain't that hot. And it's like, boy, it's too hot out there. Like, no, it's not. And like, man, they had to make us come in the house. Uh, Deacon Robinson, we didn't want to come in the house so bad that we were thirsty. We'd just go to the water hose and get some water from the water hose so we didn't have to go all the way in the house. Because sometimes if you came in the house, they would tell you to stay in the house. In or out. Don't, don't be running in and out my house, letting the air out and all that. So if, if, you, if you come in, you stay in. And we didn't want to go out, so we would stay outside, pull the water hose up, and drink water out the hose so we could stay outside. We played a lot of games when we were outside. The girls, I never figured this out, but the girls would jump something called double dutch. And they would be rocking back and forth trying to figure out the right time to jump in the rope. And then they would do their little thing. And if they had a skirt on, they would hold it up while they were jumping in the... Young girls don't know how to do that. But we would fly frisbees. We'd throw frisbees to each other and all of that kind of stuff. And then we'd play a lot of games while we were outside. All types of games while we were outside. One of the games that we played when we was outside was a game where all the people would line up and there would be one person over this side and the one person that was on this side would tell all the other people what to do with the intentions of confusing them. He would tell you what to do and then when he would tell you what to do, he would say, Simon says, raise your right hand. And then you'd have to raise your hand because Simon said, raise your right hand. But at some point when Simon was telling you what to do, Simon was going to say something where he didn't say Simon says. And if you moved doing something that Simon did not tell you to do, you were eliminated. And the goal was to be the last one that got eliminated. And Simon was always telling you to do something, but Simon would say, Simon says do it. The job of the whole game was to say, pay attention to Simon. Pay attention to the leader of the game. And Paul is saying to us in the church, God has given to the church a leader. God has given to the church a Simon. Y'all ain't going to say nothing to me. The, the question for the church is, am I watching God's given Simon? Or am I moving when Simon didn't say to move? There's a Simon says of yesteryear, but God has also given us some modern day Simons. And Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he is writing with his full apostolic authority. He is writing to them as their church father. That's why he can chastise them the way he does in chapter 3, saying, I got food for you, but I can't feed you because the food that I would feed you, you're too immature for it. I want to give you steak and potatoes, but you're too busy eating from the bottle. You can't handle table food yet. In the spirit, I want to feed you grown folks food but you can't. You can't handle that. And so Paul is now challenging them as their leader. He's challenging them as their apostolic father. And here is what Paul is urging them to do. He's saying to them, follow my example. Some would suggest that Paul is arrogant. Some would say that Paul is conceited, that he would tell someone to follow his example. Now, Paul is not saying to them that you ought to follow me in becoming a tent maker. 
No, Paul is giving them some objectives, and he is not expecting them to become a tent maker, but he is giving them some things that he is expecting them to do. Is the leader arrogant? Is the leader conceited when they expect people to follow their example? In a world that is ever-changing, how does a new convert how does a person who is fresh into Christianity, who is fresh in learning how to follow Jesus Christ, do we leave them to figure it out on their own? Or do we give them examples? There, today, the, the title of today's sermon is Follow the Leader. There's two expository points that I'm going to give you in this sermon, and then there's a main third point. That's the main point of application. So two things are telling you what the text says. The third one is telling you what the text is telling us to do. Two things. What does it say? What does it mean? Then what am I supposed to do? There's no point in looking at what it says. There's no point in trying to understand what it means if we ain't going to do nothing with it. Y'all know for a long time, that's what folks have done. They've come, listened to the preaching, but already premeditated in their mind, I'm not doing nothing that you talk about in that sermon. I pray today with the power of the Holy Ghost that there's nobody here who has already premeditated in your mind that you ain't going to do what's in this message. Can I give y'all the first point? The first thing is the leader must be an example to follow. Uh, if, if you want to be a leader and you want folks to follow you, then you must be an example to follow. Uh, Paul is not arrogant for leading others to follow him. On the contrary, I think it is arrogant to think that you're going to follow Christ without following any leadership. Can I say that again? You are arrogant if you think you're going to learn how to walk with God, but you're not going to have any human examples in front of you. There are a whole bunch of us who think, I don't need to go to church. I don't need no man. I can, and, and here's what I would suggest to you. They are miserable in the way they follow God. They're probably not doing well when you don't have a godly example. Before somebody would commit to being a leader, the leader must be examined. Uh, I think the church has done a travesty. It's a travesty to set leaders up who don't have any kind of example. You don't have no kind of track record of being an example. You ain't been an example in your giving. You ain't been an example in your attendance. You ain't been an example in the way you treat people. You ain't been an example in the way you talk to people. Why in the world should you be a leader? Uh, and every time we set somebody up who has not had a history of being a good leader, we are making the church go backwards. So there's some questions we should be asking. Does a leader's life measure up? What do folks have to say about them? Do they have noble character? Do they handle their own house well? Are their children off the hook, but they trying to tell you everything about your children? We cannot afford to pledge allegiance to leaders who do not have any credibility. And uh, th there's a thing where we used to say, hold your hand out and you should slap your own hand. If you are in God's church as a leader with any credibility, you ought to have enough decency to sit yourself down. To be a sorry leader in God's church says you don't think nothing about his church. The leader doesn't come in arrogance. 
It's in humility. It's not arrogance that says, perhaps as you are trying to find your way, you can follow my example. I think I'm following God. And if you're trying to figure out how to follow God, you can come follow me. The leader doesn't expect everyone to follow. And, and I'm here to tell you that if you are a leader, you aren't expecting everybody to follow you because everybody ain't going where you're going. Uh, I don't think everybody's going with Frankie Grayton because everybody ain't going where I'm going. I'm going in a place of holiness. I'm going in a place of righteousness, in a place of integrity. And there are going to be some folks who say, I'm not about to be integrous. Then go away from me. I don't expect you to come and you can't come if you ain't going to live in my example. Um, even when we follow a leader, we ought to continue to watch that leader to make sure that they are presently maintaining a great example. I'm not walking with you because you had a great example 10 years ago. Uh, no, you got to be living as an example for now. Are you a great example? as a deacon, as a deaconess, as the head of the choir, as the head of the music ministry, as the head of whatever you the head of, since you're so proud to be the head, are you a great example? Is it a good example to follow? Because I am in a place of trouble if I am in leadership, wherever it is, but it's not a good example. Paul has the audacity to say, follow me as I follow Christ. May I share y'all what 1 Corinthians, look, look at what 1 Corinthians at chapter 4, verse 16 says. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. When he says, follow me, he says, imitate me, mock me, pay attention to what I'm doing and do it. I, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I'm sending to you Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. Catch this. He says, he will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with that what I teach. Every church, everywhere in every church. Paul is saying, follow me. And I'm sending Timothy, who is following me, who's going to help you to follow, and that you're going to be following Christ if you follow the example that we give you. We're not blindly following leaders. We ain't following nobody out of loyalty to them. We're not following anybody. I'm looking at you to say, are you leading me to where I'm going? Because at any point that you make a detour, any point that you move away from where I'm going, I can't follow you no more. You my girl, you my man like 50 grand, but if you're going in a wrong direction, I'm not following you. Here's what my, my sister, my big sister Rita used to say, so monkey see, monkey do, huh? No, I'm not doing what I see you do. If I see you do wrong, I'm not going there with you. I don't know be no folks just following people because. I don't care what your title is. I don't care how much family we are, how much kinship I got with you. If you're wrong, you are wrong, and I'm going to call out that wrong. I ain't following you just going wrong. Every leader has this understanding that my leadership is not the ultimate goal. My goal as a leader is not for you just to follow me. My goal is for you to follow me so you follow Christ better. You getting folks to follow you for the sake of following you, you tripping. <laughs> following the leader has limitations. Say that with me. It has limitations. There's some limit on how far I'm going to follow you. Look at Philippians chapter 3. Oh, Paul has written some great things. Paul over and over was writing about this following but here in verse 17 he says join with others in following my example he says 
brothers, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we give you. He says, you ought to pay attention. I'm, I'm giving you an example. And you ought to pay attention to those who are following the example that I give you. That also means you can't pay attention to who is following the example without also noticing who's not following the example. He says in verse 18, for I have often told you before and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. You're a leader trying to lead people to Christ. You see folk who won't walk towards where you're trying to lead them. It ought to break your heart. It ought to make you want to cry. As a leader, you're setting an example, and you got folks who say, I'm not doing that. What you keep talking about holiness for? I'm going to be buck wild. You know I'm buck wild. I've been buck wild. I've been in this church all these years. Buck wild. I don't know why you keep talking to me. That ought to break the heart of a leader. This is about walking in a path of holiness. And Paul is saying, if you're trying to get to heaven, I'm helping you to get there. Follow my example. I'm saying to you, if you got leaders that you know are leading well, make it your business to pray for them. It warms my heart. I, I, don't, I don't listen to these prayers in arrogance, but it warms my heart to hear people of Southern friendship begging God on my behalf, begging God on, on leading ladies' behalf. That, that, that warms my heart to know that you all are saying, God, don't let them fall. I very almost never hear y'all praying where you ain't lifting up your pastor. Pastor, God, we need him. Don't let him be tempted by money. God, I don't care how good she look, don't let him be tempted by her. Keep him, Lord, from stumbling. Keep him, Lord, from falling. Keep him that he is a great example to the rest of us. You ought to be praying for the leader that he would continue to be a great example. But that leads me to the second thing that I find in this point, and that is that the leader must first be a follower. If you're going to be an example... And you're going to show other people how to follow you. You first got to be a follower. I said earlier, the church has made some great blunders. And I think another one of those blunders is putting people into position who sometimes has the capacity to do the job, but they're not followers of Jesus. I know you can sing, but do you love Jesus? I know you can type letters, but do you love Jesus? I know you can dance, but do you love Jesus? I know you can run the soundboard, but do you run, do you love Jesus? I know you can do security, but do you love Jesus? Sometimes we have looked at a person's capabilities without asking ourselves, do you love the Lord? I'd rather have somebody who loves the Lord but, but sing off key than to have somebody who can sing like a bird but don't love Jesus. We keep looking at, are you available? Do you have a pulse? You're a pulse kid. Come on, come on. You're alive. Come on. You can, you can serve in my ministry. No, I think we need to go back to the landmark and ask, do you know how to follow Um, Paul was qualified to lead because he's following Jesus. He isn't saying, I should suggest that you follow me, but I don't follow Jesus. I follow Jesus. And because I follow Jesus, I can help you follow Jesus. 
Y'all ain't going to help me here. There's some folks who want to be in leadership. They envy being in leadership. They, they covet being in leadership. The problem is, if you don't follow Jesus, you don't have no right to be in leadership. You don't have a right to expect others to follow you when you don't follow. That, that's someone who is expecting something of people that you can't expect of them. Uh, I, can I tell y'all this? I'm, I'm not talking because I'm mad. I'm just telling you, this is what people would do to you. This is what people do to you. They will expect things of you. Y'all, y'all never served as a pastor, so I'll just tell you about being a pastor. They will expect of you as the pastor to do stuff that they're not going to do themselves. Can, can I give y'all an example of what I mean? I better be here every Sunday. I better not just not show up. Y'all ain't saying amen, but I know that's true for you. I bet not just say, it's 7.30, I ain't going today. I don't know who's going to preach, but I'm not worrying about it. Just they, They'll figure it out. Y'all, y'all are saying, he bet not. Uh, but there's some folks that do that. They are on the roll to serve and just don't show up. No text, no email, no call. You know, we're in, a, we're, in 20, we're in 2023. We got all kind of ways to contact. We could send a pigeon. We can text you. We, we can call you. We can FaceTime you. We can inbox you. We, we got all kind of ways to send a message, and they don't send nothing. Figure out where I am. But, but I bet you, I bet not do that. Um. If you're not going to lead, you don't have a right to ask other people to do what you're not doing. Look at what, um, look at what Jesus says. Who is good? This is Matthew chapter 4, verse 19. Jesus says, come, follow me. The emphasis is on following Jesus. And I will make you fishers of men. Jesus says, Come, follow me. So anyone who is in leadership in God's church understands that they are first following Jesus. And I can only help them if I too am following Jesus. Y'all didn't say amen. Uh, I should not ask anybody to follow me who is first a follower of Jesus if, my, if following me does not help them follow Jesus better. My goal now is to help you follow Jesus even better than you were following him before you started following me. Since the leader is a proven leader, they are a proven follower only then should they be authorized to lead other people. Uh, so some of y'all are in a position where you're going to have to appoint people. Don't appoint anybody who has not proven that they can follow. Uh, you need followers in leadership. You don't need folks in leadership who don't know how to follow. You tell them to be here at 8 o'clock and they don't come till 8.15. That's not a follower. Y'all ain't, ain't saying amen. Uh, you tell them that they need, as a, in your position, you need to come to Bible study and they never show up to Bible study. Then you cannot serve in that capacity. You need to have a record of giving. Uh, why y'all get quiet? It's, you need to have, a, there needs to be somewhere where we can look and see that you are bought into God's church and we can tell because you open your checkbook. Um, only those who have submitted to following Jesus should expect anyone to follow. Let me show you what 1 Thessalonians says. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. He says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord in spite of severe suffering. You welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit, catch this, and so became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. 
Can I walk slow? Here's what he says. We lived an example in front of you. We lived in front of you the example that we were taught. Even in the midst of difficult times, you embraced the teaching that we were giving you. And we got it from someone, we gave it to you, and you took it to Macedonia and Achaia as an example. It was your following us that set you up to go be an example to them who are in Macedonia and Achaia. That was the part for y'all to get excited. The example is that you are qualified now to be an example to other people because you first follow the example. Some folks, they don't get it. There's a pattern of what it looks like to follow Jesus. And if you're coming up with a new pattern that no one has ever seen, you got to go back and go, well, where you get this from? It ain't ever been part of the pattern of Jesus to cuss folk out. Uh... It ain't the pattern of Jesus to not speak to people. Y'all, y'all not, that's, that's, I don't know where you're getting that from. That, I don't know, where, what, what book you in? Some of us got a, uh, there are 66 books in our book. Some of us have uh, another book. Y'all don't know this book, but there's, there's a book called Petalonians. Uh, some folks got, uh, <laughs> they, they major in being petty. Um, if anyone blindly follows a leader who is not following Christ, here's what you have done. You have agreed now to let them lead you away from Christ. I know they're not following Christ, but I sign on and co-sign for whatever they do. That's wrong. Here's what I want to tell you, that if you blindly follow somebody just because they're in your family, just because y'all been in the same church for years, you are co-signing to them leading you away from Christ. Uh, so if you're going to lead, and you expect folks to follow you, you got to be following Christ. And I want to tell you this, that no leader that you may be under, you're not obligated to follow them if they're not following Christ. Their behavior towards you is not indicative that they love Christ. I would approach them about their behavior. You're not asking me to serve in your ministry, but you don't have Christ-like qualities. And every time you act un-Christ-like towards me, I'm going to check you on it. The tone of your email was un-Christ-like. The way you slammed the phone down in my ear was un-Christ-like. I'm going to check you every time you say something to me, and in a way that's un-Christ-like, I'm going to say something to you. Yeah. No church should be guilty of subjecting membership to sorry leadership. Now, there are times when we know this is a sorry leader. And, uh, and, and you set folks up to follow a sorry leader. Y'all don't have to look at them. Don't, don't look at the sorry leader. But maybe uh, y'all know some folks that are pitiful when it comes to leadership. Um, here's a few questions that you should be asking yourself as, as you think of this. As, as you consider those that, that you're following, here's some things that you should be asking yourself. If my leader leads well, do I follow their example? Because some of us know that, that we have a good leader, but you don't like him. You, 
You got a good leader, you don't like her. She in the wrong family. They lead well, but, but you just, you're not going to follow them. For whatever reason, you've made up your mind. I'm not following her. I ain't following his example. Here's, here's the question that you got to ask yourself. Why do I not follow when there's a good example? Because sometimes there are really good examples in front of us, but we have made up our mind, I'm not doing it. Here's, here's a question we ought to be asking ourselves. How can God love me enough to give me a good leader who gives me a good example, but I won't follow my God-given example? Can I take this personal? Three years ago, God made it fit that he would send Frankie Grayton and Talita Grayton to this church. I ain't bragging, I'm not arrogant, but I'm telling y'all, I think I lead well. The question is, why did God send me a leader and I refuse to follow the leader that God has sent? I don't know, you work that out yourself, but, but that's something for me to figure out, why do I have a good leader? Who's honorable, respectful, tries to do things the right way. I mean, he got a gap in his teeth, got this weird hairstyle, uh, love golf and all that. But, 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 but why? Why won't I follow my leader? Why am I determined I'm not going to be holy? Why am I determined that the church is talking about discipleship and teaching, and I made up my mind, you ain't teaching me nothing. I don't know nothing about the 66 books. I don't know that there are 20, 27 in the New Testament, 39. I don't know nothing about that, and I don't want to learn it. Why? Jesus is the ultimate example. And as an example, all of us ought to be patterning Make an, an imitation of him. He comes down for 30 and 3 years, down through 42 generations, and lives here on the face of the earth, setting a pattern. And now for thousands of years, we have been looking at his pattern and imitating his pattern. He's been giving us a pattern of how to do leadership, giving us a pattern of how to live, giving us a pattern of how to love, giving us a pattern of how to serve, a pattern of how to forgive, a pattern of every area of our lives. Jesus has given us a pattern. Now, are we really followers of Jesus? If there's stuff that's identifiable with my life, not identifiable with his. Could I really see Jesus and his disciples smoking hookah? I'm not being funny. Could I? Is this part of the pattern that I follow? The way I talk. Could I imagine that what I look at on YouTube is what Jesus would look at? The only fans that I'm subscribed to, is that what Jesus, y'all y'all not, uh, uh, there, there's some stuff that we do that I got to ask. Could I imagine that this is part of the plan that Jesus has for my life? He's a great example for us. And now I got to say, uh, am I following his example? Can I give you all a piece of application? Look for Christ-like character in every leader who influences your life. Do I see a person who acts like Jesus would act? There's a second part to this, and because I think much of me, and I think much of my ministry, 
I have vowed that I would only follow those who walk in a manner that leads me closer to Christ. They're preachers I won't have nothing to do with. Because I've looked at their lives. And you might say, well, you judging them. I am. I'm judging whether or not I should walk with them. I'm judging about whether or not they should have any influence on my life. Because you know when the red car runs into the white car, the white car gets red paint on it, but the red car gets white paint on it. And you can't run with folks and not get them on you. A little bit of corruption corrupts everything around it. So, are you running with folks you shouldn't be running with? Are you in the clique, but you should get out? Because you've been with them a while now, but you can see they ain't up to no good. Sometimes we follow people that the truth is we ain't got no business following. And if I be truthful with you, sometimes the very people that we should follow, we made up our mind, I ain't following him nowhere. Some folks stay far away from me. And I see it. And I'm saying, you don't want nothing to do with me, that's fine. Because I'm on this side walking in holiness and righteousness. And if this ain't what you want, stay over there. Yeah, and we'll pretend like we're in the same church doing the same thing. Yeah, we're pretending. Do a wink. Stay over there. I know you won't mean holiness and righteousness, but you stay over there. I'm going to stay over here. Yeah. We'll come in and do the holy hug thing and all of that, but I know you ain't doing what we're doing. Uh, examine those people that you are letting influence you. Those leaders that are influencing you, that are influencing your behavior. Here's this. Vow that I am only following those that I know are following Jesus. You're not pulling me off track. I'm not ending up in a place where I got to come back and beg God to forgive me.